This is Daniel Lopez Dio with osteopathicconsiderations.com. The purpose of this site is to give osteopaths perhaps a different perspective and a different way of looking at certain structures that they either usually don't think about or uh, don't think about in a particular way. So today we're going to talk about the coracoid process. The coracoid process is a finger-like projection from the scapula that projects anterolaterally under the clavicle. The coracoid process serves as an attachment point for muscles and it helps to stabilize the clavicle and the shoulder joint via ligaments. It runs in close proximity to the glenohumeral joint and because of this uh, oftentimes people may confuse the coracoid process for the head of the humerus. Now the coracoid process is an interesting structure because it is the connection or a connection between the arm, shoulder, and anterior chest wall. Now let's review some anatomy associated with the coracoid process and then go into some osteopathic considerations and some demonstrations. The coracoid process has three muscle attachments, and the first one that we're going to look at is the pectoralis minor. Now, the pectoralis minor attaches to the medial body of the coracoid, uh, posterior to the muscle attachments of the coracobrachialis and the biceps brachii. The pectoralis minor attaches from the coracoid process to the ribs three through five on the chest. And pectoralis minor is innervated by the medial pectoral nerve which arises from C6 to T1. Interestingly, the medial pectoral nerve also pierces the body of the pectoralis minor. And in a Japanese study, there uh, was a mention that there is communication from extramural fibers that are supplying the intercostal muscles to the medial pectoral nerve. So uh, that could be impo important to address the extra or the intercostal uh, muscles as that may they may also have an impact on the uh, pectoralis minor. Next we want to look at the biceps brachii and the biceps uh, is attached to the coracoid process via its short head and the long head of the biceps attaches to the superior glenoid. Uh, on the, at the other end then the biceps attaches to the radial tubercle and then also the bicipital aponeurosis so uh, it does have an influence on the elbow and the elbow then as a result could have an influence on the coracoid process. The bicipital aponeurosis continues into the deep fascia on the medial part of the forearm. The biceps brachii is innervated by the musculocutaneous nerve. Finally, there's coracobrachialis. Coracobrachialis attaches from the coracoid process to the upper one-third of the body of the humerus. And coracobrachialis is innervated but also pierced by the musculocutaneous nerve. Next, let's talk about ligaments. There are five ligaments associated with the coracoid process that are involved with limiting the motion of the clavicle and the acromion and also stabilizing uh, the shoulder. The coracoclavicular ligament is the first one that we're going to talk about and that cons consists of two portions. Uh, one is the conoid and the trapezoid ligaments and these work to stabilize the clavicle. Uh, the trapezoid ligament is anterior but it and it, it attaches to the undersurface of the clavicle and the conoid also does and uh, it is more posterior. They both are uh, attached to each other and anterior to the coracoclavicular ligaments we have the subclavius and the deltoid and then on the posterior aspect you have the trapezius covering them. The coracoclavicular ligament is considered part of the AC joint even though it's not actually part of the joint and that's because of its importance in maintaining the relationship of the joint. The coracoacromial ligament runs between the coracoid process and the acromium, both of the scapula. And the purpose of this ligament is it helps form a vault protecting the head of the humerus. The deltoid sits on top of the coracoacromial ligament and then deep to the ligament is the tendon of the supraspinatus muscle. The coracohumeral ligament attaches from the coracoid process and then out to the lesser and greater tubercles of the humerus although the majority of the attachment is to the greater tubercle. Here it blends with the supraspinatus tendon and then also becomes part of the shoulder joint capsule. On the posterior aspect is the superior transverse ligament which attaches 
from the posterior aspect of the coracoid process to the scapula. And this ligament bridges over the suprascapular notch and has the suprascapular nerve that runs uh, beneath it within the notch. From here it courses inferiorly to supply the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles. I won't necessarily show a specific treatment for uh, this ligament, but I think in this case the most important thing to consider is the actual positioning on how the scapula is, is on the ribs, and this may be a result of an exaggerated kyphosis in the thoracic spine and uh, anything that may be pulling the scapula out of its correct and normal positioning. The last ligament that we're going to talk about is the costocoracoid ligament, and I've seen differing information about whether it actually is a ligament or not, but this is formed by the lateral border of the coracoclavicular fascia, which we'll talk about more uh, later on, and it extends from the coracoid process to the cartilage of the first rib, so uh, this may make the treatment of the first rib uh, important in terms of uh, getting motion in this whole mechanism. The clavicopectoral fascia runs deep to the deep layer of the pectoral fascia that covers pectoralis major. And there is loose connective tissue between these two fascias to allow them to glide independently of each other. The clavicopectoral fascia arises from the clavicle and then envelops the pectoralis minor and the subclavius muscles. The clavicopectoral fascia also forms the coracoclavicular fascia. There is a triangular shaped layer of the clavicopectoral fascia from the upper border of the pectoralis minor to the clavicle that's named the coracoclavicular fascia. And this fascia is pierced by the thoracromial artery, the cephalic vein, and the lateral pectoral nerve that supplies the pectoralis major muscle. Now let's go back to the clavicopectoral fascia. Superiorly, the deep layer of the clavicopectoral fascia covering the subclavius muscle blends with the deep cervical fascia. And laterally, it helps to form the axillary fascia and then also the fascia of the coracobrachialis muscle. Medially, the coracoclavicular fascia extends from the coracoid process to the cartilage of the first rib and then also the first two inter intercostal spaces which it, with its thick lateral border named the costocoracoid ligament, as we mentioned previously. Now let's go over some osteopathic considerations. As with any structure, it's always important to understand normal versus abnormal anatomy. As a rule of thumb, always palpate and compare both sides to see how they feel, how they compare in motion, sensitivity, asymmetry, and anything else that stands out. And always, always recheck after treatment to evaluate what, if any, effect the treatment has had, not just at that localized spot, but overall in the bigger picture of the patient. So the first step in evaluating the patient is, is observing them. Uh, when they're standing, do they have any exaggerated kyphosis? Uh, is the rib cage, uh, is there a twist in the rib cage or the thoracic spine that may be affecting the way the shoulders sit on top of them? And also then sitting at the head of the table, uh, observe the patient while they're supine and see, first of all, how, what the relationship of the shoulders are uh, to the midline. Are the shoulders pulled anteriorly? Are they pulled medially? Any combination of the others. Uh, and as you do this, then you can gauge as and, and see what may be happening with the patient. Uh, and then a simple way to evaluate uh, how the coracoid processes are doing is simply to spring on them. And you don't just want to spring on the coracoid processes uh, solely. You also want to spring perhaps on the upper rib cage because of the pectoralis minor and then uh, also palpate the brachioradialis and biceps brachii perpendicular to the muscle fibers. Uh, that will make it stand out as to whether there is any issue with those muscles. They'll be more sensitive and they'll feel ropey. And then finally palpate the axillary fascia in, in all different planes. Now before we begin with any treatments, it's going to be assumed that you've treated the overall person first and then now you're keying in on these more localized areas. And an important place to really pay attention to and treat, as we've mentioned before, is the thoracic spine and the rib cage because they form the base that the shoulder sits on. So 
If the shoulders are pulled forward, it may be due to one side or both sides of the rib cage being stuck in an extension, a cranial extension pattern or a rotational curve in the spine and ribs or an exaggerated kyphosis of the thoracic spine. To evaluate the coracoid process, first uh, we're going to do a quick and dirty evaluation of, of some things to check uh, that are associated with the coracoid process. So first of all, we want to uh, palpate it and you're going to find the, the knob um, along the lateral aspect just medial to the head of the humerus and inferior to the, to the clavicle and it points anteromedially so uh, there is going to be uh, so you can palpate the medial surface of it. Now before you even start, you want to observe your patient. Uh, you can observe them first standing and how they're walking in. You, you can observe to see if they're kyphotic or if there's a, a scoliotic pattern or anything like that that brings one shoulder forward. Uh, evaluating them supine, you also want to check uh, one is one shoulder more anterior uh, than the other and you can compare the two and then also if one shoulder is closer to the midline than, than the other. So those are all things that you want to start out with evaluating. So now uh, we, we, do, we can palpate the, the coracoid process and, and we can do a quick, uh, just a quick spring on it to see how well it moves and also you can, we can get a hold of the clavicle and, and wiggle it back and forth uh, along uh, near where the coracoid process is to, see, to evaluate it. After that, the uh, coracoid process also has the pectoralis minor attachments to it, so we can do just a quick spring on the rib cage along there to see how that feels and to see if there's any involvement there. Next, we want to check also the uh, glenohumeral joint and see if uh, there's any compression there. A lot of times it, can, it, it will be compressed at the joint and then also the head of the humerus will be driven uh, superiorly up towards uh, right underneath the chromium and that can limit the motion of the shoulder uh, and, and then after that uh, the coracoid process has the coracobrachialis attached to it and that attaches to the upper third of the glenohumeral or the, the humerus so we can we want to palpate the muscle medial uh, medial to the biceps and then we want to move our fingers perpendicular to the muscle fibers and if that feels ropey, uh, likely that's going to be tender and, and there's, going to, there's going to be sensitivity there. Uh, we can also do the same with the biceps and there's a ropiness there. You can, uh, you can almost see it as well. And then lastly, we want to see how the, sh how the elbow moves. Uh, and, and we can do that by su supinating and pronating and then also checking its, its end range by taking it into extension. And we'll go more in detail as we go along with, with, with each thing that we're going to treat. The purpose for treating the pectoralis minor is to improve rib cage mechanics and help get the scapula more appropriately situated on the rib cage. Having the scapula appropriately positioned on the rib cage can help release any tension on the suprascapular nerve going through the suprascapular notch under the transverse scapular ligament. Releasing the pectoralis minor can also help release intercostal muscles deep to them or vice versa. The purpose is not just because its ability to influence the rib cage and pull the coracoid anteroinferomedially, but also to help release the clavicopectoral fascia. Releasing the clavicopectoral fascia can help release the subclavius muscle, which may then help improve rib one motion. This can help if there's a compression of the neurovascular bundle between the pectoralis minor and rib one. In addition, the coracoclavicular fascia has the thoracoacromial artery, cephalic vein, and lateral pectoral nerve piercing them. Also, releasing the pectoralis minor can help improve lymphatic drainage in the region because of its proximity to many of the axillary nodes. Normalizing function of the ribs can downregulate any facilitation of the medial pectoral nerve piercing the pectoralis minor and have an effect on the sympathetic chain ganglia sitting on the posterior rib heads as rib function is improved. A release of these structures associated with the coracoid process can help improve shoulder, arm, and rib cage mechanics. So for the pectoralis minor, the very first thing we want to do is treat the clavicopectoral fascia and that uh, 
starts at the, at the clavicle and then it wraps uh, underneath or around the subclavius muscle and then it envelops the pectoralis minor. So the very first place we want to even start is actually going to be getting the fascia directly under the clavicle. And so we can do that very simply, indirect or directly or indirectly. Uh, in this case, I'd like to evaluate it directly and I check it in all different planes, in, both uh, in a superior, inferior plane, and then also medial to lateral. And, and I will often try to release that uh, simply by uh, getting the fascia wound up tight until that releases. And, and that can help also release rib one because of the subclavius attachment there. Uh, and then once this releases under here, then we can go on and check underneath the pectoralis major muscle. That's where the clavicle pectoral fascia uh, continues and envelops the pectoralis minor. Uh, that the two planes of fascia have loose connective tissue between them, so that they're, the two planes can can glide well. So then we can get under the pectoralis major as best as we can, and then palpate that fascia and the ribs as well. Uh, note too that the any intercostal muscle tenderness in this area can uh, facilitate the medial pectoral nerve and, and, and cause the pectoralis minor to be, uh, to be hypertonic. And that has to do with some communicating fibers from the uh, nerve that are innervating the extramural or the, the intercostal muscles. Once this releases, then what we want to do is we want to we want to disengage the whole shoulder complex off of the rib cage and then bring it. Uh, we're going to bring it up away from the body and then uh, and diagonally also out and then rotate it posteriorly. So we're going to be doing the opposite motion. So we get one hand underneath uh, and we're getting a hold of the the whole scapula as best as we can. Uh, and you can use the spine of the scapula as a good handhold or a good way to, a good place to uh, isolate the, the scapula. Uh, then we're going to get on the undersurface of the, of the coracoid and you want to gently first disengage. So you're going to bring everything superiorly until you feel a resistance. And then, and then I can rotate it posteriorly and then also bring it out laterally some. Uh, so in this case, I then will hold this until I feel it release. And then go back and recheck to see how things are. If you need, you can also get a hold of the uh, the coracoid process and the spine of the scapula with one hand uh, and then also you can fixate the ribs three through five. You, you will have to isolate them but they generally tend to run around the mid, middle of the pectoral region of the rib cage yeah. and then once you have them isolated you can uh, you can also wiggle your the coracoid process and you'll feel the, the ribs associated with the pectoralis minor wiggle and once you isolate them then you can also uh, you can also use your hands uh, on those ribs to fixate them and then move the, uh, move the coracoid process in whichever direction you can take it direct or indirect until those let go. And then once you're done, go back and reevaluate the whole area and, and the things that we checked before. The purpose of the lateral scapula release is to reposition the shoulder complex more appropriately on the rib cage. This can help get pressure off of the rib cage, allow the fascia to unwind, and let the muscles involved to relax. This will allow better expansion of the upper rib cage during inhalation and better uh, compression or recoil during exhalation. Releasing a medial shoulder often allows the trapezius to relax as it attaches to the clavicle and the scapula. The abnormal medial position of the scapula may cause it to form knots. This release can Im help improve lymphatic drainage by creating more space and less tension in the region. Okay, next we want to do the lateral scapula release. And this is simply to 
first of all, get the uh, shoulder complex off of the midline because a lot of times it will be pulled, the shoulders will be pulled medially and that can affect the whole, uh, the whole, all the muscles and everything associated with the shoulder. Uh, in this case, I'm going to demonstrate it on the right side, which is actually the side that is uh, better compared to the left. But in this case, after treating it, then we have something to measure against uh, for when we, we would do the, the left side. Uh, so this is done similar to uh, how we did part of the pectoral minor release. Uh, and, and what we want to do is get a hold of the, of the medial border of the scapula. So I'm going to do that with my bottom hand and get as much of the the bottom or the medial border of the scapula as I can. And then I'm going to place traction on that. But before I do that, I'm going to get my whole hand as best as I can, uh, this portion of my hand under the clavicle, and then even a little bit medial to the coracoid process. So then having that handhold, I can bring everything first superiorly and then laterally. I'm going to provide traction once I've got it all uh, once I've got it disengaged off of the rib cage. So once I've got that, then I'm just going to hold this traction here until it releases, and then I'll go back and recheck uh, how things have changed. Okay. The purpose of releasing the elbow joint is to improve the function of the elbow and as a result get the biceps brachii to relax. A dysfunctional elbow will affect the muscles associated with the joint, including the biceps. Besides treating the ulna's motion on the trochlea of the humerus, it is important to treat the head of the radius as the biceps directly attaches to the radial tubercle. The biceps attaches to the medial forearm via the bicipital aponeurosis and into the deep fascia of the forearm. Releasing the biceps can help get pressure off of the coracoid process and overall shoulder. Normalizing function at the elbow can help downregulate any facilitation of the musculocutaneous nerve arising from C5 to 7 and help normalize the sympathetic intervention in the upper extremities from T2 to T8. At times, releasing the elbow will improve motion of the rib cage. To release the elbow, first we want to evaluate how it springs. And the reason this is important is because of the biceps brachii uh, crossing over the elbow joint. And then we have the short head attaching into the coracoid process and then the long head into the glenoid. So uh, this can be an important structure to treat to get a full release of the, sh of the shoulder. And even oftentimes that will, just treating this will help release the anterior rib cage. And so the way we're gonna evaluate the elbow, first we're gonna get a, a hand under the olecranon and we're simply going to uh, take it into extension. And what we want to feel uh, is how well, the, uh, how well the elbow joint is going into that extension. And then is the olecranon fitting in the olecranon process uh, appropriately. So once we've done that, then uh, in, in, to treat this, you also want to make sure that, uh, first that you treat the interosseous membrane and then oftentimes the carpal bones and that'll be something we'll do another time. But today we're just going to go into the treating the elbow joint and then also the radius. So we've, we've sprung here, we've evaluated that it's, there's, a, there's an issue here. So uh, what, the way we're going to do it is we're going to take it into slight, uh, take the elbow into slight flexion and then using our hand on the wrist we're going to provide traction until we feel uh, until we feel that uh, that's disengaged the uh, olecranon out of the olecranon fossa a little bit and then we're going to move it the forearm or the wrist either into uh, a medial or lateral direction and generally i will take it uh, towards the point of ease and then hold it there until it releases. And then after that, you can go back and recheck and the, uh, the olecranon will, will spring better in the olecranon fossa. Next is the, uh, we wanna treat the radius because of the attachment of the biceps into the radial tubercle. And oftentimes it's a very tender area and even the antecubital fossa will feel very uh, tense as you evaluate it. So uh, what we wanna do here to evaluate is, is we can check either just pronation and supination and, and see if there's one direction where it, doesn't, uh, where it doesn't move as well. And then the way we're gonna treat that is 
uh, we want to disengage the radius, so we're going to actually take the wrist into ulnar deviation here. And what that does is through the interosseous membrane, when you, when you do this, it also pulls the radius uh, down, so it disengages it, and then you can, maintaining that, take it into pronation or supination, and you, you'll, look, you'll be looking for a point where, uh, where it feels easier, and then once you have it, like, in terms of the motion, where it feels you've got the most ease, and then after once you have it at that spot, then you can take the radius into, uh, take it, pull it, bring it superiorly, and you're going to do that simply by taking the wrist into radial deviation, and that'll bring it up and fit, fitting into its appropriate position, and then go back and recheck how the motion is at the radius there. And then once you've done that, go back and recheck you can recheck to see how the biceps muscle feels compared to where you started, the coracoid springing, and then the chest wall as well. The clavicle is important not just as an often overlooked component of the shoulder, but also as an attachment point for muscles in the clavicopectoral fascia. As a result, the position of the clavicles can produce tensions through the fascia that result in bad posture. In this case, we're trying to free restricted movement of the clavicle on the coracoid process. This can help free fascial planes and improve shoulder motion by helping the clavicle move better through its normal motions. Next, we want to treat the coracoclavicular ligament, and that ligament runs uh, from the coracoid process to the undersurface of the clavicle. It's made up of the uh, trapezoid portion that's a uh, anterior and then the conoid portion that's posterior and they're both attached to each other. Uh, but so what we want to do is fixate the coracoid process and, uh, and you can do that either uh, anteriorly with one hand or you can you can use a, a handhold where you have the coracoid process with uh, either your thumb or your fingers and then uh, the other portion under the spine of the scapula. In this case I'm just going to fixate the coracoid process anteriorly. Then you, you can get a hold of the clavicle near the angle here, and what you want to feel for is uh, you, you can fix you can fixate the coracoid process and then glide the clavicle either anteriorly or posteriorly and just see how well it moves. The ligaments are going to work to restrict the motion, so that can give you an idea of, of where things may be uh, where may be taut with the ligaments. So what we're going to do, once we find the area where there's not as good a motion, we can balance out the tension. So we're going to bring, in this case, uh, I can fixate the coracoid process and then I'm going to bring the uh, clavicle anteriorly and then I may provide some uh, inferior, so down towards her feet, uh, compression also to, to get the ligament to release and then uh, another motion that can be important to get it to let go can be uh, rotating the coracoid process like a radio dial until you feel it uh, until you feel the most uh, relaxation possible and then you hold it there until you feel the structure is released and then once you have more motion and then you can go back and recheck to see how things are feeling and that's the you know, coracoclavicular ligament release. The glenohumeral joint often feels compressed where the head of the humerus is internally rotated and may be pulled superiorly and then compressed under the acromion in the vault formed by the coracoacromial ligament. This will have an effect on the shoulder muscles and fascia associated with it. This can cause the biceps brachii and coracobrachialis among other muscles to be hypertonic by facilitating the musculocutaneous nerve. Therefore. Releasing the axillary fascia can help release the clavicopectoral fascia and the fascia enveloping coracobrachialis. Furthermore, an abnormal relationship here can make the coracohumeral ligament to be taut and put tension on the shoulder joint capsule. The shoulder can be influenced by the axillary fascia. Releasing the axillary fascia can also improve axillary lymphatic drainage. The purpose of releasing the glenohumeral joint overall is to release and normalize these structures when they are dysfunctional. Now we want to release the glenohumeral joint, and a dysfunction here can uh, cause the coracobrachialis to become hypertonic, so we want to release that. Oftentimes the glenohumeral joint is compressed into the 
the, the head of the humerus is compressed into the glenoid and then also uh, stuck uh, superiorly under the acromion. So what we want to what we want to do here is get a hold of the uh, the spine of the scapula and then also the clavicle uh, with our hands. So we fix fixated both uh, of those structures and then with our other hand we can get a, a hold of the arm and then we can provide traction. Uh, at the shoulder, so we can bring it down, and then you can uh, you can get it out of the uh, from under the acromion. Then after that, we can switch our handhold. Get a hand. Uh, we're going to place our hand into their axilla uh, as close to the joint as you can, even, and we're going to provide a gentle traction. Now, uh, do this gently, and then with our hand that's under the axilla, we're going to uh, provide some lateral. Uh, pressure to just try to disengage the head of the humerus off of the glenoid. Uh, also, while we're here, uh, once this is released, you can also check the axillary fascia, which is a, the clavicle pectoral fascia is continuous with that, but the axillary fascia is a convergence of a lot of different fascia, so you can move it in different directions and that can give you an idea of where you may need to treat to get the, the rest of the shoulder to let go. A strain pattern in the coracoacromial ligament can be indicative of an intraosseous strain of the scapula. This can change the amount of space the head of the humerus has in the vault that is created by the ligament. This can be affected by the head of the humerus being anterior. After relocating the head of the humerus on the glenoid, then we can work to normalize the coracoacromial ligament, and by releasing an intraosseous strain, a more correct shape to the vault can be achieved. This can help maintain the optimal position of the glenohumeral joint. Next, we're going to do the coracoacromial ligament release. And so this is a ligament that covers the same structure, you know, the, the scapula, between the coracoid process and the acromion. So the ligament runs across there, and it helps to form uh, a groove for the head of the humerus so that it, it, it's stable in the shoulder joint and doesn't slip out. Uh, this, can ha this can become strained through an intraosseous strain that's a warp within the bone itself. And so uh, we can palpate it, uh, we, can, we can palpate to see if, any, if there's any feelings of uh, density in the bone. It doesn't move as well as it should, both either in the chromium or the coracoid process. And we can simply try to bring the acromium close to the coracoid in, in a slight compression uh, until you feel it relax. That's one way of trying to get this uh, ligament to release until you, until you feel it let go. Another method that I like is uh, one is through uh, Stephen Davidson's work of neurofascial release and if there's a intraosseous strain, so warp within the bone, you can palpate the strain and then uh, using the other hand this hand monitors, the other hand will uh, can, can be anywhere on the body and it's going to look for a point where uh, things release. So in her case, as I bring my hand uh, closer, to, uh, closer to the end of her clavicle, then uh, right here there's a change here under this hand where then this ligament releases. And if, if you want to learn more about that, I recommend checking out uh, the neurofascial release work. And, once that lets go, then you'll feel a change uh, between the two structures and in a, then in a, you can reevaluate to see if there's better motion there. Now it's time to go back and recheck on your patient all the parameters and compare what we started with versus what we have now with not just the coracoid, but then all those other parameters that we've been checking. And hopefully you've been checking them as we've been going along. Uh, so. If there was any limited range of motion with the shoulder, then go back and see if any of what we've done has uh, improved any range of motion here. And hopefully you will find that there's, there's an improvement here and the, the patient feels freer in their shoulder. I hope you found this information useful and has given you a different perspective on the coracoid process. If you'd like to continue getting more information like this, uh, then visit my website uh, www.osteopathicconsiderations.com and sign up to get osteopathic considerations on other topics as they come out.